Good morning, my friends. Welcome to service today. I'm so glad to see you. We seem to be having quite a quiet crowd today. Um, that's great. We also want to welcome the people that are watching on YouTube. Um, we're glad that you have that way of staying in touch with this congregation, and we'd like to invite you, if you are available on a Sunday morning, to join us at 930 Pacific Time on Zoom Live. But in the meantime, enjoy the um, YouTube version. I, when I say you're welcome, I I'd like to follow that up by reading to you the first paragraph of our welcome statement. The community of Christ Church is an open and affirming Christian community who lives in God's love and grace. We strive to welcome and include all people because we believe God loves and welcomes all people. And we commit to work for racial justice in our church and our world. Regardless of race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, nationality, ethnicity, marital status, physical or mental abilities, political stance, or theological perspective, or anything else that might divide us, you are welcome here. Thank you for joining us. Before I say the prayer, I have we, there's something we haven't done in quite a while. So I would like you to look at the person next to you. And if you are all alone, then look into your monitor and focus on one person. Look at that person in the eyes and say to them, you are a beloved child of God. And then that person should say it back to you. You are a beloved child of God. We should say that to ourselves and to each other on a daily basis. Let us welcome the Lord into our worship today. Let us pray. Oh God, in this hour we pray, we invite your presence. What we know not, teach us. What we see not, show us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Violet. And I just have to say that uh, beginning before the prayer, um, reminding ourselves that we're beloved children of God, um, based on the text I'm about to read, I'm sort of tempted to just say amen and not say anymore. But, uh, uh, but of course, I'm a preacher and I like to talk, so I am going to kind of expound on that. But I love, uh, that, is, that is the gist of this text we're about to read as you are a beloved child of God and reminding ourselves about that. So thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to share my screen and um, read our gospel reading for today. Our gospel reading comes from the gospel of St. John, the fourth chapter. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples he baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a Samaritan city called Sikar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is, that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 
The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give you will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more than comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is God's good news for us today. Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. We know that this is truly the savior of the world. When we talk about Jesus as being the savior of the world, oftentimes we're referring to the fact that Jesus saves us from our sins. I want to spend some time today talking about sins and sin and shame and the consequences of living in a world of sin. Let's talk about the um, Samaritan woman first. The way that this story has often been read, there has been a tendency for us to look at the Samaritan woman as being a sinful woman, 
Um, we point to the evidence of her having had five husbands and now living with a man who was not her husband. Um, but in fact, none of the clues that we are given about the Samaritan women point to her being sinful. There are lots of circumstances under which she may have had five husbands. They may have died. Life was hard back in those days, and life expectancy was not as great as it is now. And um, it's very possible that these men died young. If this was a matter of divorce, it's helpful to remember that in this culture, in this very patriarchal culture, women had very little agency. And so if there was divorce, it wasn't on the part of the woman, it would have been on the part of the man. After having had five husbands, it may have been difficult for her to find somebody who would marry her. But being a woman in a very patriarchal culture without support and, um, and um, male presence in her life, um, she needed to be with a man for protection, for to um, make it easier for her to live and to survive. And so it's very possible that this was the best arrangement she could find. I want to share a quote from Paul Tillich, a theologian who in his um, essay, You Are Accepted, writes these words about sin. And apologies up front for the very gendered language, but this was the day when he was writing. Have the men of our time still a feeling of the meaning of sin? Do they and do we still realize that sin does not mean an immoral act? That sin should never be used in the plural and that and that not our sins, but rather our sin is the great all pervading problem of our life? Do we still know that it is arrogant and erroneous to divide men by calling some sinners and others righteous? He goes on to say, I should like to suggest another word to you, not as a substitute for the word sin, but as a useful clue in the interpretation of the word sin, separation. Separation is an aspect of the experience of everyone. Perhaps the word sin has the same root as the word asunder. In any case, sin is separation. To be in the state of sin is to be in the state of separation. He goes on to talk about the three main ways that we find ourselves in a state of separation. Separated from one another, from our fellow human beings, separated from ourselves, from our true selves, who God created us to be, and lastly, separated from God, from the divine source from whom all life comes. This is a powerful way to think about this story, separation, John makes it clear that there are separating lines in this story. Samaritans and Jews. Samaritans do not hold things in common with Jews and vice versa. And it's important to recognize that in this scenario, this is not a case of the Jews totally um, one-sidedly uh, despising or holding in disdain uh, the, the Samaritans. It was mutual. Samaritans felt the same way about Jews. And who knows all of the details of that history, but some of it is about theology, some of it is about practice of their religion. Chief among those is the idea of where the temple should be. The Jews believe that the temple should be in Jerusalem. The Samaritans believe that it should be on Mount Gerizim. And these were points of contention. So these two people were separated from each other from their theological um, disagreements and ecclesial disagreements about how to practice their faith and to understand their faith. 
It's also clear that there is separation between men and women in the story. The disciples are um, taken aback by the fact that Jesus is talking to a woman. And while it's not really clear how that division came about, because there are definitely stories in the Old Testament of men and women conversing, um, still it seems pretty clear from John's story that there's a division between genders. I would go a step further and say that the fact that the woman was at the well at noon, the height of the heat of the day, and that she was there alone because there doesn't seem to be anybody else at the well, suggests that there is a separation between this woman and her community. It suggests that the fact that she has had five husbands and that the man she is with now is not her husband is a topic of conversation in the town. That she is looked upon a certain way. Again, separation. So through, her sta through uh, the state of sin that we all live in, she's separated. She is um, separated from her community, um, separated from, uh, from other men, separated from Jews as a Samaritan woman. And here comes Jesus. And Jesus seems to ignore all of that. Jesus meets her at the well and asks for a drink of water, something that is just not done in that society, apparently, and begins a conversation with her and talks openly about the div divisions between Samaritans and Jews, but also points to a time, and actually he says, and the time is now, when those differences of where is the temple don't seem to mean anything anymore. That God is doing something new that brings all people together in spirit and truth to worship God wherever they are and whoever they are. In our world, there are lots of ways that we also think about separation. And it plays out as sin. Division can be um, can have divide, di dire consequences on the well-being of people, being divided and set apart because of who they are, uh, what their skin color is, what their ethnicity is, whether they are a Christian or not, or whether they are a Muslim or not, or any religion. Divided because of gender divided because of a perceived sense of morals or perhaps a perception of a lack of morals, all kinds of ways that we find ourselves divided. Jesus bridges those divides. Jesus crosses over in love and compassion and in truth. Jesus may have spoken directly to the woman about her condition, about the circumstances in which she lives her life, but there was no judgment there. He was simply stating the reality of her circumstances. I was, uh, I, list, I like to listen to podcasts and um, I was listening to an interview um, the other day, it was actually um, on Monday. And I was struck, I don't know, does this happen to you? Sometimes just the most offhand comment can kind of just stick with you and, and just kind of um, just stays with you and you kind of ponder it and, and kind of turn it over in your mind. And this uh, statement uh, that was made by the person being interviewed uh, just really stuck with me, especially in relationship to this text. So I'll give you some context. The conversation was between the actor Peter Dinklage and uh, the comedian Mark Maron. Now, Mark Maron has a podcast where he interviews celebrities uh, in his garage, uh, sometimes on Zoom because of COVID, but lately has been inviting people back into his garage. And they have these really amazing one-to-one -one conversations. 
Some of you may be familiar with Peter Dinklage. He is an actor. Um, his breakthrough role was in The Station Agent, um, known for playing Tyrion Lannister in Game of Thrones. Um, and, and you may, if, you, if you're not familiar with Peter Dinklage, it's important for you to, to know that Peter Dinklage was born with a form of dwarfism that affected his bone growth. So he stands uh, at four foot five and, um, and just as an, an amazing actor. Last year, he was in a film uh, that I haven't seen yet. I'm really looking forward to seeing. It's a version of, of the story of Cyrano de Bergerac. And in fact, his wife wrote the screenplay for this movie, uh, Erica Schmidt. And she made some interesting choices in this film. She decided not to give Cyrano a big nose. She decided to leave that part out of the story. Um, but just to tell this story, for those of you maybe who aren't familiar with Cyr Cyrano about this uh, charming but shy person who has a, uh, who is in love with this young woman, um, but doesn't feel, um, and of course the original story was because of his nose, didn't feel that he uh, could win the girl. Um, so uses his wit and his um, flowery language to help uh, a young man named Christian uh, woo her. So Cyrano puts words in Christian's mouth so that he can woo uh, Roxanne, the girl. But as I said, in this story, um, Erica Schmidt decided to leave the nose out. And after reading the script, Peter Dinklage said, I'd like to read this. I'd like to, I'd like to be in this story. Now, that's a big setup for a very offhand comment, but I wanted you to have the context. So here's what he said. My size is not a substitute for the lack of a nose. It's just sort of, it's sort of, uh, perhaps I was drawing upon stuff in terms of feeling insecure about yourself on bad days. In terms of feeling insecure about yourself on bad days. I don't know about you, but that in uh, on bad days hit me hard. How many of you have bad days? I can't see you all, but I'm going to guess that everybody raised their hand. Everybody have a bad day now and then? I have bad days. <laughs> and um, we all do. And what I notice about bad days is that when I'm having a bad day, um, I am less likely to look in that mirror that Violet or, or look, look across at somebody else and hear the words, you are a beloved child of God, right? All of my flaws, all of my shortcomings uh, sort of come to the surface when I'm having a bad day. I can be insecure and self-conscious and forget that I am a beloved child of God, that I am beloved by people in my life, um, that I have gifts to get to, to share. Um, we all go through that. We all have those bad days. And, you know, the bad days can be a variety of, of reasons. Um, I don't know, for me, it can be uh, too many days of rain and gray can give me a bad day. Um, if I don't get enough sleep, I can have a bad day. If somebody uh, says something to me that feels like an insult or an attack, it can make me have a bad day. Now that's on me, but still it could, that can be the thing that, the, that triggers a bad day, right? And when I have a bad day, I am also insecure and I forget that I have gifts and that I am worthy of love. And, um, and when I'm having a good day, when I'm having a good day, when the sun is out um, and um, I'm, I've got enough rest and I'm you know, well hydrated and all those things, I can actually look at my, the things that maybe people would call flaws or shortcomings or things that make me different or, or unique or weird 
uh, and embrace those things because those make me uniquely who I am. And that's a difficult thing to do, but I, it's easier for me to do that when I'm having a good day. And it's harder for me to do that when I'm having a bad day. So I appreciate this very capable, very amazing actor who acknowledges insecurity on bad days. I would imagine that Peter Dinklage has a lot of good days where he is like embracing who he is fully. And then when he's having a bad day, find himself insecure about whatever makes him different. We all do that. I wanna suggest that there are some people who have more bad days than I, than I do. Uh, people who have more bad days because of the circumstances or because of the community around them. People who, because of uh, their skin color or because of their age or because of their financial uh, or economic status are looked down upon by other folks making it harder for them to have a good day, making it harder for them to look in the mirror and say, you are a beloved child of God. Now, I hope that they have good days. I hope they have good days where they can, can recognize their giftedness and their belovedness. I am wondering if the woman at the well was having a bad day that she was at the well by herself in the middle of the heat of the day bringing water back home, finding a time when nobody else would be there so she wouldn't be the subject of gossip, so she wouldn't be the subject of ridicule, so she wouldn't be set apart or othered for who she is. And she encounters Jesus. And Jesus sees her, all of her, all of her giftedness and belovedness, all of the things that maybe the world would say are shortcomings or flaws or sins or whatever, and sees her and proves to her that he sees her by naming aspects of the circumstances of her life that she hasn't even uh, disclosed, perhaps because of shame. Oftentimes when we're having bad days, Oftentimes, when the world is telling us that we are not worthy of love, we can fall into a state of shame, where we're ashamed of the things that we have done or have said, or, or who we are, or maybe we're feeling like we just are not beloved and feeling ashamed. The woman runs back to the city to tell people, come and see this person who told me everything that I did. And I believe the subtext of that statement is who told me everything I have ever done without shame or blame or judgment, just loving direct acknowledgement of the reality of our lives. So I wonder, and Jesus continues to cross borders. Jesus continues to bridge those divisions. My goodness, he goes, uh, the, the Samaritans come out to see him. And again, he is a, a Jew amongst Samaritans. And they come out to check this guy out because they heard this woman say, um, you should check him out. He knows everything I've ever done. And Jesus stays with them stays with them for two days, which means he is like residing in their homes and breaking bread with them and making connections with them and breaking down all of those separations that we sometimes take for granted, that we sometimes believe are insurmountable. Jesus, through love and compassion, breaks through the separation, breaks through the shame that we often experience as a result of that separation. We will continue to fall short. We will continue to find ways to, um, to divide ourselves. 
And on bad days, we will use those divisions to shame or be shamed. I wonder if our role as Christians, as a church, as people who follow the crucified and risen Jesus, if our role in life is to reach out and do our best to give our neighbors and ourselves as many good days as they can have. Give them a good day of affirmation and love Remind them that they are beloved children of God. Look in the mirror and give ourselves that same reminder. You are a beloved child of God. Because on those good days, we can let go of the shame. We can let go of the ways that we feel insecure and self-conscious and unworthy and less than. And embrace our belovedness. You are a beloved child of God. Amen. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to join into breakout rooms uh, for conversation and um, just invite you to share the peace with one another, remind each other that you are beloved children of God, and then just check in. Um, Maybe you're having a good day. Maybe you're having a bad day. Share with each other uh, what your days have been like in the last week. And we will bring you back in about 10 minutes. If you prefer to stay in, um, in the sanctuary, we'll provide music and images for your prayer and contemplation. And then we'll bring you back in 10 minutes. So I say to you, the peace of Christ is with you. And also with you. Amen. Lord, you showed us true humility by becoming one of us, yet too often we practice pride. You cried alongside your friends for the city of Jerusalem, yet too often we rush past the pain of others and are careless about our cities. You loved those who are weak, despised, or cast out. Yet too often we love those who are strong, respected, or popular. You freely forgave and healed. Yet too often we hold grudges and cause pain. You lived a perfectly holy life. Yet too often we do not yearn for righteousness. You prayed that we who believe in you should be united with each other and with you. Yet too often, we focus on the differences that separate us from other believers. <clears throat> you were mocked, whipped, and even killed for us. Yet too often, we deny you. You call us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Yet too often, we blend into or hide from our culture. Father, we are sorry for the many times we have left you and chosen to satisfy our own selfish desires. For the times we have hurt the members of our families by refusing to do our share of the family's tasks. Father, we have sinned, forgive us. For the times we were unkind and impatient with those who needed our time and concern. Father, we have sinned, forgive us. For the times we were too weak to stand up for what was right and allowed others to suffer because of our cowardice. Father, we have sinned, forgive us. For the times we refuse to forgive others, Father, we have sinned, forgive us. Dear Lord, please hear now the prayers of your people.
Lord, um, please help all of us to reach across the divides that separate us in all the ways that separate us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Loving and gracious God, in a world where we are constantly tempted to place people into categories, to make decisions about who is worthy and who is not, who is within the circle of love and grace and who is outside of it, who we can justify separating ourselves from, Help us to follow the way of Jesus. Help us to follow the way of Jesus in the way that we see one another. May we see ourselves and our neighbors not as the world sees, but through your gracious and loving eyes, dear God. All of these prayers that we pray today, spoken and from our hearts, we lift up to you in Jesus' loving name. Amen. Our worship continues now with our offering, uh, and we celebrate and um, uh, give gratitude for all the generosity of our people and support of this mission and ministry. If you feel called to, um, to uh, give an offering today, there is a, um, a link in the chat uh, to our giving page. And um, during that time, we will also um, appreciate and give thanks to our worship team for their gift of, of music as we sing Holy Spirit. I invite you to stay muted and sing along.
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. Our worship continues now with the sharing of, of the meal, the Lord's Supper. So I invite you to find your elements for communion and bring them close. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, Father who art who in are heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. And now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We have some current events in our community news to share with you. First, 
I want to remind you of our winter needs collection that we're in um, doing together with the Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran Church. The donations are being accepted through Sunday, the February the 13th. Um, there's an article in the current faith news that you can read because the print's kind of fine on the screen. But you have an option to make a financial donation if you would like to. There's a drop down menu on our giving page that indicates that it's for Greater Good Northwest. And that money will be forwarded directly to them, which is then again directly used for client needs, not for any, none of it goes for administration. We are asking for uh, new and gently used items. And gently used means they're it's they're able to, you're able to wear them and they look nice. They don't have woken zippers or missing buttons or big tears or stains on them. They're looking for all sorts of winter weather gear and blankets and socks and um, sleeping bags, if you have some, um, raincoats, ponchos, hats, gloves, and also hygiene items for the homeless, uh, such as toothbrushes, toothpaste, shampoo, and conditioner, all the kinds of things that people might need who don't have a um, physical facility to use. We, um, they, there is a drop off site at Shepherd of the Valley that is open on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from noon to 4 p.m. in the Northex. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, noon to 4, drop them off there at the Northex, and um, we'll make sure that they that they get these. Oh, yeah, by the way, back to the gently used, they also need to be clean, of course. So we want to remind you that we're still on track, hopefully to worship together at Shepherd of the Valley on Saturday, the February the 26th at 5 p.m. Of course, Omnicom is still out and about and, and making people sick, but we're watching the numbers and praying that we will be able to get together and we will announce the details of how and what the protocol will be uh, as we get closer to that date and we're sure that we'll be able to move forward. But in the meantime, keep that date, February the 26th, the Saturday at 5 p.m. Keep that open so that you'll be able to join us should we be able to do that. There's a Reconciling in Christ meeting this week. It's always the first Thursday of the month and it always sneaks up on me and I, I'm, I'm never quite prepared for it. So it's this Thursday. At 6.30 p.m., there will be a link in the Faith News that you can attend. We'd love to have you. We're making a variety of plans and trying to help other churches out that are beginning the journey um, and figuring out a way to get the word across and to do more educational events. So join us this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. February celebrations. We're looking for those people that have special dates coming up in the month of February, birthdays, anniversaries, um, significant events of any type. If you would uh, make sure that that information gets to Rachel at the, in the admin office, she can add it to the list. And um, a list will be prepared in the next Faith News that will show all those people with birthdays and anniversaries. And then we will be able to send them a card or a note or a text and acknowledge their special day, their way of staying in touch with our neighbors. I also want to remind you about Faith News. It comes out every Thursday, generally speaking, in the afternoon. It contains lots of information about the worship service and also contains the bulletin. You might not realize that, but we do have a bulletin in there every week on how the, the service will play out for the following Sunday. It, there's online on programming. It tells you um, not only our own church um, task force and meetings, but also meetings that are in the Oregon Synod or the um, e, um, various other groups that you might want to take part of. So it's full of newsworthy information. If you're not on the list, contact Rachel and she will add you to that. Um, if you are getting the faith news and you think somebody else, whether they're a Lutheran or not, might enjoy coming to some of our events, just forward the email to them and they'll have the links.
Thank you, Violet. We are nearing the end of our worship service. We have a sending song to share with you, I invite you to stay muted and to sing along with our worship team as we sing, I Lift My Hands.
Go in peace to love and serve our God. Thanks be to, God. be to God. That concludes our worship service for today. I invite you to stick around for coffee conversation. If you're heading out, we wish you a blessed week and look forward to seeing you again next Sunday.